Hi, welcome to the Julie Rose Show. Today it's Eric and I, and I just wanted to welcome you, Eric. Thanks for being on the line. It's good to be here. Appreciate all that you're doing. Um, Eric, why don't you go ahead and introduce our topic of choice today? Okay. So, Julie, this is the third of what might be considered a three or four part series we've been working on to record what you see in the future in various parts of the United States. So, to date, we have one episode on the West Coast going from Alaska to Southern California. The second episode went from Southern California eastward to about Nevada, kind of getting into Texas. So, that could be a good starting point for today's topic. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so for those that have not listened to the others, or even those that have listened to those, what we're doing is going through the United States and just talking about what I see, some of what I see coming in the United States in the near future. I'm not going to go into super specifics in certain cities at this time, although later on down the road, I don't know how many how many um, days or weeks down the road, I do plan on going back to specific regions and states and in some cases cities and being more specific. So for those of you that have um, sent messages asking for more specifics on certain areas of the country, just know that I am receiving your messages and that is the plan, but I'm following the spirit as to when we're going to do these podcasts. So stay tuned look to those podcasts later on where we get more specific about Arizona or St. George or the Kansas City area or different areas of the country that you're interested in. Um, we also are going to go through and do some podcasts on what I see on different continents in the, in the world. So keep in mind that this is a big world. There are a lot of people that are interested in hearing this information. I get dozens of emails a day with people asking questions. And when it comes to the comments section or questions that you have, online with YouTube, iTunes, um, Podomatic. or Podomatic, yeah, and soon to be Vimeo. Um, I am going to be doing some video podcasts with another group here starting as early as June. I don't know when those will be broadcast, but I'm going to start doing my first Vimeo broadcast, which will be video, and I'm going to record that um, the third week of June. So stay tuned for that, or excuse me, the fourth week of June. Stay tuned for that. We'll have some, I think that's going to be broadcast on Vimeo. Um, and so of those, just keep in mind, I'm covering as much as I can, as quickly as I can, but we're trying to follow the spirit on what we're going to put on these podcasts. And so just keep, keep checking in on the channels and um, subscribe to the channel and it can email you to let you know when we have a new podcast up. Um, okay, so starting uh, approximately where we left off last time, um, we've got a lot going on all over the world and all over the country when it comes to the tribulations between now and through the tribulations as we go into the millennium. So I'm trying to do a basic overview, not to overwhelm people too much, but to give you a basic overview and idea of some of what I see. And then again, we'll go more specific at a later date. One of the reasons I'm doing that is because there is so much that I see that there's no way to cover it in, in one podcast for even a certain region or state without feeling like I'm picking favorites for those people. And I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that I am listening to the audience, that you, you guys are hearing me when I say I get messages from people all over the country and from across, across the seas. And it's, it's just not very fair that I focus just on Utah or Arizona or Texas or certain states um, although we have a large group of people and, that are, are tuning in in those areas. So. Well, and, and also, Julie, it's layered, right? As I've talked to you, I've kind of yes. learned that as you've seen it, you you may have seen things from a high-level view, and then you kind of got shown a closer-level view. So Absolutely. So the first time I saw – I'm glad you said that, Eric, because the first time I was shown a lot of this stuff – um, in my NTE and then in Dreams and Visions is they'll give me, a, like, coming in from outer space, an aerial view, and they first honed in on the Denver, Colorado area and the Kansas City area and then parts of Utah, and they showed me cities of light, and then they expanded out from there some of the other things going on that were going on in the country at the time, and that's exactly it, Eric. It's totally layered, and if people can open their minds and hearts to that, realizing this isn't a one-time shot, this is a layered message 
that there are a lot of things going on in the world right now, and there will continue to be a lot of layers to this message. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly what it is. Just think of it from, um, well, well, Eric, you do maps from a, we've talked about this from a mapping standpoint when you do maps. And I, in some cases, I could start specific and then expand out to a greater area or region. In other cases, it's easier for me to start from a, a more distant viewpoint and then hone in into specifics. Well, so and that's, that's the approach we're taking right now. That's something just from my own little witness when I first read your books and I still didn't know you. I One of the reasons I knew your story was legitimate was because you described being shown from an outer view and then you moved in. And I... I knew as a as a mapper or a geographer sort of that you that there's really no other way to conceptualize all these topics without seeing it at multiple scales. So anyway, just a little mm-hmm. side witness there. Thank you. And that's exactly it. I see it from multiple angles, multiple views, multiple dis- distances and scales, and that's a really good description for how I see it. It's it's very layered. And they'll show me different angles, everything from close-up views of actual expressions on people's faces to the extended view out where I'm actually seeing, like I said, from outer space or from the skies, mass movement of supplies or people or, or, um, or you know, different, different types of movements going on when you're talking about what's going to be going on in the country and then across, across the world. And all of it working in conglomeration with the eternal plan that Father in Heaven has. So so to try to explain that to someone when they're not inside my brain can get confusing. But the more you guys listen to these podcasts, you know, it's going to become more and more apparent to people that I'm not making this stuff up because if if you could see what's inside my brain, there is only one way that I get this information, and it does come from a supernatural source. I don't study maps. I don't study uh, geography. I don't study the sciences these days. I'm a mom of three. I'm married. I'm busy. I'm trying to, trying to run a relief organization. I'm doing energy work. I'm taking my kids to sporting activities and their youth activities. I don't have time to study this stuff. It is coming through direct revelation and downloads. And it's coming because this is part of my mission. So I just wanted to explain that it does come in layers. And I'm thankful to you, Eric, for bringing that up. Sure. So with right, that, so let's, uh-huh. we're going to start in what, Nevada or New Mexico area? Well, let's go back over, um, just for how my brain's working, we'll go back over, yeah, to Nevada. And then as Nevada goes in, a lot of people from Nevada will um, go to, to higher mountain places. They'll go over to the St. George area. People in Arizona will go on up to St. George, or they'll go into the high mountain areas. They'll go into Snowflake and some of those, the Pine Valley and other areas where there's places of safety. And people in New Mexico, they'll go into the, the highlands um, where they can find mountain, mountain passes and safety. There'll be transportation um, issues as you go throughout the world and throughout the United States. And so I see a lot of people on foot. Now, we will utilize transportation as long as we can get gas and as long as we can have access to those vehicles. But recognizing that... Everything from foreign troops with checkpoints or our own government putting up checkpoints or, or um, marauders or uh, different groups of individuals and communities that won't allow outsiders in. There are so many layers to why people end up going on foot. And, um, and hopefully people are as prepared as possible to initially go with their own transportation and, and that's one of the reasons it's important to stock up on fuel, gasoline, and other things where you can. So you can be as mobile as possible and not just rely on your own two feet when you could use a vehicle. Um, in addition to that, um, going from there, we talked a little bit about in the last podcast about Colorado. I'm going to sidestep Colorado for now. I want you to go back to the last podcast and listen to that. Not the last podcast, but the last podcast on this when we talked about that and let's focus a little bit more on the central United States or the Midwest region, roughly speaking um, in the Kansas city area uh, in the near future. What I do see is um, some, some nuclear and also um, other types of warfare going on. Um, again, I'm not going to get specific today. I don't want to cause panic and fear in these cities. You've got to know that I see 
um, like smaller nuclear invasion or bombs or other types of missiles going off in most of the large United States cities and most of those larger cities. If you've got a city of about a million or more, you can count on the fact that they will absolutely target those cities and that they will use everything from chemical warfare and gas and bombs to actual um, nuclear or other explosions, in some cases similar to what they did, like with the Boston bombing, which was a false flag event. So um, everything from small-scale um, escapades to uh, larger planned events, and that includes like the Willis Tower in, in, um, and the airport in Chicago and other things. So anywhere where there's conglomerations of of um, mass groups of people. Look at what they're doing in Europe, what's been going on for the last few years with some of those false flag events as well as some of those real events where people have had bombings and other things in train stations and in some of the buildings of the arts where they've had concerts and things going on. You will see that in the United States on mass scale. Additionally, looking at um, the Midwest where you go into Missouri, I see the St. Louis Arch being twisted due to the um, both the, the physical atrocities of what goes on in that city as well as the, um, the Great Madrid uh, with, um, and this is a side note, I do see the city of Enoch returning in the Gulf of Mexico. There will be a large earthquake that will come up up to Madrid going through St. Louis and following that pattern of the highway going on up um, all the way up to the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes expanding out into basically an inland ocean. It'll be several miles wide. It'll wipe out portions of entire states um, if you were to fo follow that line. I think in a, in a later podcast, we'll actually put up, I want to focus just on that Madrid earthquake, Eric, and do um, a podcast just on the effects of Madrid and be able to show people where the line of the Madrid goes and we can put a map up of, of roughly those areas that you and I have already mapped out, generally speaking. That would be interesting. We'll do that on a future podcast. And we'll do the same thing for the Great Salt Lake area, being able to show some of that because in Salt Lake, the Great Salt Lake area, when those aquifers go off, the Great Salt Lake, there is a landmass um, portion in the plateau area in the Great Salt Lake. If you were to look at it from aerial vision on Google Maps or if you're in an airplane and you look, and I actually see that landmass in Salt Lake or the Greater Salt Lake rising two to 300 feet and flooding that entire area in the Salt Lake Valley and beyond. Look and study about Bonneville Lake, the ancient Bonneville Lake, and you can expect flooding in the entire Bonneville Lake area and extending beyond that several feet. It'll be um, absolutely huge flooding, everything from dams breaking to other um, lightning and rainstorms and hail and all that causing some of that flooding of the Great Salt Lake. Also aquifers that'll be, be opened up and things from the earthquakes. So moving back over to the Midwest, We've got North and South Dakota. Now, I haven't seen as much happening with North and South Dakota, mainly because there's not as much of a population out there compared to some of the other states. And I myself have never been to North and South Dakota. That's one of, those are two of seven states that I've never been to personally. The other states I've actually visited at least once in my life. And for whatever reason, I have not seen as much going on with North and South Dakota other than checkpoints that I do see and some of those bluffs and other areas coming alive with some of the volcanic activity, I do see um, huge, massive rain, hail, and snowstorms, however, with that cold weather and those extreme temperatures in North and South Dakota, as well as Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and some of those upper states as you get into Wyoming and Montana. Again, Wyoming and Montana having several places of refuge as they go through, people coming down from Canada and people in Canada going north, specifically to the Edmonton or the Cardston areas. Most of the people from Edmonton coming down to Cardston and those people on that border, Cardston, Cardston Canada being on the border of the U.S. Um, and Canada. Um, Cardston, Alberta, Canada is a safe city or will be a safe city once they they are able to secure those borders of the city after um, invaders come in. It will be one of the temple uh, temple sites and one of the, the early um, cities of light and one of the um, most, I guess you could say, the brightest cities of light that I see in Canada, at least for a time, until after New Jerusalem is built 
and um, other cities will then, you know, grow from there. Uh, in Wyoming, I see those passes as you go into the Rexburg area being utilized. We will have safe havens um, throughout Wyoming, throughout Montana, and um, I see a lot of ranches and other places where people will seek safety, where they will just go where there's open range and land to put a tent or other facility on top of um, acreage. Same with New Mexico, although I see New Mexico being a dangerous place um, in large portions of that state, again, because people will come up through Texas and through Mexico utilizing access points in New Mexico. All right, I'm going to take a breather right there. Eric, do you have any questions while I take a, a little break and give people a chance to process that? Sure. I guess one of the things that comes to mind is we can discuss things from a spatial standpoint and where things are happening. Another question I'm sure some of your listeners have is the temporal aspect or what the, the timing of these events. And I'm wondering right. if these, I, again, I'm sure it's layered, but um, it like, is. like what is the time period that all this traveling is taking place? When does it commence and when does it kind of end is another question. Okay. So what I see is um, the Wasatch Wake Up being the beginning of the official tribulations or days of sorrow. I see that Wasatch earthquake happening. I thought it was in the spring. I'm glad we're doing this. It reminds me. I have seen what looked to be spring green grass. But I am, um, as we go into this, to summer here, the Spirit's been working on me and opening my mind up to the possibility as the neighborhood that I saw, the friend's neighborhood that I saw, which was in Springville, Utah, with the green grass that I keep being shown, has a sprinkler system. And that was brought to my attention when I was talking to them and to another friend. And that opened my mind to the possibility that here I really thought we had a spring earthquake coming but perhaps it's summer, it could be even an early or late fall. And I just assumed because I saw grass that color and I don't live in Utah, I'm not familiar a lot with some of those weather patterns. I just assumed it was um, a spring earthquake because of that spring green grass. And I heard the words like a spring green grass. I was never told it was spring green grass. I was told like a spring green grass. That was the verbiage given to me. So I wanna make it very clear, that that is the relations. I do believe, I don't know that it's happening this year. I do believe it's very possible that that earthquake could happen this year and that it could happen anything from, you know, the next several weeks to months. And we, I, I think it'll be interesting to find out if it's tied to this eclipse that's coming in August and it has to do with some of the planet alignments. That would not surprise me one bit if we have some kind of an earthquake in the Wasatch tied to some of that. Um, I've been seeing more about that. They've been showing me a little bit more about that. They give me clues, but they do not tell me exactly when it is. But I get little bits of, of information to help me put it together that have to do with things in my personal life as I'm traveling for GTRF in June, July, and August. And so um, with that, I want people to keep their minds and hearts open to the possibility that we're not putting a deadline on this that there's going to be an earthquake, you know, by June 22nd when summer ends or summer begins, but that it could be possible that we don't see an earthquake until the fall. And whenever we do, um, you know, a good source is Dutch Sense. I don't listen to him regularly, but I have people that send me things. You can study up on those earthquakes, and he's absolutely magnificent in describing some of that and looking for the signs. So on the timing of things, it's really hard to know the timing, but my understanding from what the Spirit's telling me and the clarity I have now that's ongoing but is continuing to improve as we get closer is I believe that that um, we can have uh, we could have a gathering or a call out as early as spring of next year, but I don't know when it is. It won't be before March of 2018. I do not believe that there will be a gathering officially called by the LDS prophets before the spring of 2018. But I don't know that for sure, but I do not believe that it will be. In my dreams and visions, what I'm being told for personal revelation is my family will get an invitation in March of the year, but I will have a way station and I will not leave until July of that same year. But I have not been told what year that is specifically. Um, I have things in my life that I have been given specific dates on that have uh, kind of parameters set around that, and I can kind of do a little bit of guesswork, but I don't have specifics as to knowing that it's going to happen exactly then. What I do know 
is that um, I see and understand and hear that after there is an initial gathering, then the troops come in, then, then the ring of fire and all of that really comes alive. And that happens from what I, what it seems like, it seems like that happens in like September, October of a year. And again, as early as 2018, but not before then. I don't know for sure. And those, those um, natural disasters, everything from the volcanoes because of the ring of fire opening up and causing underground aquifers as well as volcanoes to activate, everything starts to happen very quickly. And it's hard to tell on a time frame because time is kept differently in the eternities. So to me, it can look like it's happening all at once or within a matter of a couple of days, but it may actually be happening within a matter of months or a couple of years time frame. Mm. Either way, it's a very short amount of time to go from having a relatively calm system, a very calm scenario in the United States to having seemingly total chaos. And so um, once it happens, then it's like it's firing off again and again and again. And it's so fast and it's happening one right after the other that the country just doesn't even have time to recuperate. And then we've got the Gadiantans who are utilizing, um, you know, utilizing and taking advantage of the fact that um, that people are vulnerable, that they're needy, that they're out of jobs, that they're that they don't have any money to buy groceries or that they don't have access or they don't have fuel and things like that. And so when we're talking about this stuff, it's important to be prepared now because when it happens, it will be too late. You will not be able you when it happens, whether it's the dollar crashing, whether it's food, food not being on the shelves, your debit card or your EBT cards or whatever not working, when it happens, it is too late. And I don't say this to instill fear. I'm speaking truth. You don't want to wait. You don't want to be that person that could have fed your children. And because you decided that you would rather not do that right now because this sounds crazy, then you have, you know, four hungry kids looking at you crying because you didn't, you, you decided to go buy, you know, $500 worth of um, electronic gear when you could have bought food storage. So I, I just don't want to be that person. I don't want my kids looking at me. It's one thing if your kids are starving and hungry after everything you could do. It's a totally different deal if I knew I could have done something and because of my lack of self-reliance or my lack of motivation or my, my lack of obedience to the Lord's spirit, I have starving kids because I didn't do my part. So that's great, Julie, to, to go through that. There's more on the timing. One, one of the original questions I asked there was like, how, how long does this, I guess, oh, migration go on? Like, yeah. The so migration mm -hmm. for years, for years, people will be migrating. I see, you know, three years out from when there's an initial gathering, people still coming from across the coast and across the United States trying to make their way to safety. And they see pictures of the cover of my book. Maybe they go into somebody's house and they're scrounging for food and the place has been desolated and there's nothing there, but they find a book and it has a picture of the Tetons. Or they listen to a podcast after I've already gone to a place of safety and they come across a podcast. I see this. I am planning on having my personal website up long enough. Um, I'm not going to say how long, but long enough that people can still access these records clear into the tribulations. Interesting. And you see like an initial migration that's sort of, it's done conventionally with cars and other right. modern forms of um, transportation, but then eventually I'm guessing it's kind of on foot, maybe bicycles or Right, a lot of it. And then people will still be able to use cars and other things even later on, depending on where they find fuel or if they've stocked up on it or if they have access to pure energy and things that I see later on as we go in into the ends of the tribulations and well into the millennium when we have pure energy. So there are, there are a lot of different avenues and abilities. I think we should utilize as much technology as possible. Don't rule that out but not be dependent on our phones with GPS and other things and making sure that we have physical records of things that are important to us, like phone numbers and realizing that there is going to come a time where you will not be able to use your cell phone. The towers and stuff will be re reutilized later on, but you need to be prepared to, to use ham radio or other forms of communication. If, if your cell tower goes down or your satellite system goes down and you don't have a way, whether that's because somebody messed with the grid or there's an EMP on a different level, 
There's so many different reasons. Or maybe because the only way to find safety is to go somewhere where you can't get a cell signal. And then that's where a lot of lives are preserved, is going and hiding out. If you, if, um, I haven't watched these shows, but I was at a graduation party on Sunday, and there was a gentleman there talking about his son that um, works in data, and he was he, uh, for, the, for the elections, and they were, they were looking at all the data, and they were using tracking um, from everything from Facebook to Google to other social media to determine, you know, the number of votes that would come in, who was voting, the demographics of those votes, you know, if they're men or women or college-aged or children, you know, how many children they had in the house and things like that. They were using that to predict the elections. I can tell you right now, if they're doing that, they will use it to their advantage on everything else. And then they were talking, he was talking about, you know, something that a lot of people don't think about, which is how we are being tracked every week go. He brought up a show, and I don't know the name of it, but he was talking in the group about a show where you, and people probably know this, but it's like a reality TV show where you can earn like several thousand dollars or something if you can go 30 days without being tracked. And he said over and over, people always lose the government or the people who are running the show, right? But they're getting, they're utilizing all kinds of avenues for records. People running the show, obviously they didn't want to give the money up. So they were using everything they could to track these people. And the one couple that won, the reason they won is because they went into a forested mountainous area. They didn't contact anybody for the entire 30 days. They had no technology on them that could be tracked and they didn't use any debit or credit cards. Hmm, interesting. And I thought that, I thought that was pretty profound. Yeah. Okay, Julie, so the last you left off, geographically speaking, was North and South Dakota. Where do we go from there? So on North and South Dakota, if you go over to the Great Lakes, you've got Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Again, extreme weather when it comes to flooding, when it comes to um, everything from um, kind of mini tsunamis when, the, when that weather gets really bad and the the Mississippi and Missouri River will flow backwards with the Great Madrid, which will cause other problems up in the Great Lakes, overflow those lakes, flooding cities nearby like Duluth and some of the other places that are right there on the coastal areas. I say coastal, but we're talking about the Great Lakes, Lake Superior and, and Lake Erie and all the all the Great Lakes out in that area and out as far as far east as New York and um, and that whole Great Lakes area. The Tri-Cities, again, I don't see the Tri-Cities making it um, with, with what's going to happen just with the Great Madrid. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that when we do the Madrid and where that inland ocean is going to be created. This is not to cause panic. This is to let you guys know if you're in that area that you need to have a game plan that you might not think about the fact that you're going to live there for the next 30 to 40 years. And you need to be willing that if you want to save your life or the life of a family member, you might want to consider that you live there now, but when the time comes that danger arises, you leave willingly instead of waiting and holding your ground and drowning or something. So there's a lot of reasons why I'm sharing this. It's not, it's not to cause panic, but it is to make people aware that we need to not be attached to things. And some cases we need to not be attached to places. And I learned that as a kid growing up in the military. I really like that, that last comment. Um, to, to make this a little less physical and just kind of make it more, uh, more, I guess, active faith and belief and mm -hmm. an exercise of willing to following the Lord's guidance and stuff. Right. Wherever you go and whatever you do. And, um, you know, in past, past times in history, if you look at what has happened, everything from people settling Europe to the nomads in the Middle East to the, the French nomadic people or going clear back even to Eastern Asia when the Mongols, Mongolian people or the Mongols came over into Europe and settled Germany. And I think this is something that people need to be aware of if they, because we don't learn about this enough in our school systems about how certain populations were civilized throughout different times and generations. There were people from all over this planet who have had to be nomadic for their mere survival and for life sustenance. And we need to be willing to switch our mind frame and think about that. Are we willing, if need be, to pack up our family and go somewhere if it meant the matter of life and death? Mm. Yeah. Let me ask you another question, Julie. I wasn't planning on asking this. It just came to me. Um, what about those listeners who are thinking right now, well, Julie's just giving away the whole game plan right now. 
You know, you're telling us just how it's going to go. The, there are probably Gadiantans or others who would want to use this information against us to thwart the plan. What do you think of those that? Gadiantans, those Gadiantans already know it. There's no hiding from Satan. Satan already knows. They've been planning this for decades. The people that don't know are the ones that don't have their eyes opened and their ears open and their hearts opened, and that's who we need to educate. The Gadiantans already have their plan. They're putting into action. The only thing this is going to do is wake people up. I am not afraid to tell people what's really going on because that's my instruction from the spirit because we can take an offensive strategy other than just defensive. We know that, that according to scripture, it is not okay for us to go on the attack, but it is also not okay for us to just sit by and let the Gadiansons run wild. And that is exactly what they've been doing for far too long. And the more people we can wake up to the reality of the situation, the more we realize if people in the LDS church think that there's any way that you're going to hide millions of people in white tents or any other colored tent in the mountains, they got enough thing coming to them. That is not why we're safe. We're not safe because we're hiding 300 tents in a community. We're safe because we have priesthood power utilized by God with ministering angels and men and women who come together in unity. That's why we're safe. And because we don't have, you know, we're not in the main cities where so much of this, um, of the main warfare is going on, at least on the initial front, because they're going to take out the masses first that are, are not awake, that are not aware, and that are not, um, that, that are basically the easiest targets. And so there is no hiding. Satan has, has powers. He has communication channels. Cain is on the earth right now. Those communications are going on. This is real stuff. And if anybody thinks I'm crazy, they can think I'm crazy because I've had interactions with these people and I'm not messing around and they're not either. So my job is to do what I can to wake people up and testify that God has a plan. And part of that plan is to help people realize that they're not powerless when this happens. I appreciate that witness. I want to add my own witness to this, that I do believe very strongly that those who work for evil forces have a, a near complete awareness of things that are going to happen in the future. And um, those who those who are either kind of, I guess, apathetic or just not awake or not following this stuff, we just have the disadvantage. And it is time for us to wake up and start listening to the music because I want to testify that is one of the reasons Julie and other people like her are coming, coming forward at this time. I also think of Jonathan Kahn and just a number of other people who have warning messages, and that that is a, a consistent pattern in Scripture, both in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, that a time comes before destruction that the Lord calls warners, teachers, preparers to warn people and give them another, um, just another competitive edge. And I hope that those who are listening to your podcast right now will consider your message as a divinely inspired message from the Lord. Thank you. I appreciate that, Eric. I want to I want to wrap it up. This is going to sound a bit like a diversion, but I've had some communications with Eric and a couple other friends lately. I went on a Friday night and had a date night to go to dinner and watch the Wonder Woman movie with my husband. And I got to tell you, with what I know about my mission and with what I have gone through and some of my premortal memories and things that I deal with on a daily basis when it comes to adversarial attacks, that movie triggered me like no other. I have watched several adventure movies, several of those Marvel comics. Um, I don't read those. I don't study them. That's not part of my everyday. But when I went and saw that Wonder Woman movie, it triggered me. And Eric, you know it did. I sat in the movie theater next to my husband, and for a good 10 minutes, I sobbed my eyes out. I want people to pay attention to that. If you watch that movie, what they do and what she does, she does not... She doesn't just, you know, roll over, right? She knows her mission. She knows what she's supposed to do. She has divine guidance in that. And when Satan or Ares in that movie came after her or any other dark entity or dark person who was participating in things that were not of the light, she took it upon herself. And when he said to her, you are a foolish girl or a foolish woman, you know, momentarily that caused her caused her fear but when she found her true power that is when she took him out and i want people to pay attention to that with your own missions when you realize who you are because 
she didn't know who she was for a long time. Once she knew who she was, then she was able to fight with true power because it was from within. And that is a gift that only the Lord can give you through your divine nature. And I think people need to look at the reality. I, I'm amazed at that movie. I'm, I'm, um, I think it's interesting whoever decided to, to do that movie. And I want people to pay attention all through our media, our TV shows, our movies, so much of the messages that are coming through, subliminal messages from both the light and the dark side, people need to be paying attention. Um, Eric, I think we need to wrap it up from here. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and stay tuned until next time. See you next time.